Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zidna ilman rabbal alameen So last time, alhamdulillah, we talked about the smiling and the smiles of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how he used to smile and also about his humor sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we saw some examples of it how he used to kid and joke with the Sahaba, with the people around him, what he used to say. And we said that he وسلم, when he would joke around, it would be in moderation and he would always say and speak the truth وسلم, never lie. And we said that it's also a common habit of people today, that when they want to be funny, what do they do? What happens if we want to be funny? And what, I'm sorry? Sarcasm. So you're being sarcastic, you mock other people and we ridicule something about them that hurts them and hurts everybody who hears this. I mean, anybody who has that quality, whether you're, you're too fat, you're too thin, you're too this or too that. So you mock them and also you lie. Right? You fabricate. So fabrications and mockery. So this is what passes for humor. But the humor of the Prophet wasallam was not, nothing like that. It did not mock people and was not based on lies. But he وسلم, would speak the truth, but he play on words sometimes. Right? And we saw that. So now we move on to another chapter. And this is about The poetry that the Prophet وسلم, would incorporate into his speech. And that's important. Because we'll find in the Quran that Allah Azzawajal criticizes poets. But there's a specific type of poetry that is criticized. And there's some other type of poetry that is praised. So a poetry that is criticized is the one that, just like laughter, the same idea where it's based on lies, or it leads to falsehood, includes falsehood in it, that is haram. That is haram. Any type of poetry, actually any type of speech, but specifically the poets, especially let's focus on Arab, uh, Arab poets, because I'm not sure if all poets today do that or not, but our poets, when they want to boast, they'll exaggerate. Exaggerate their qualities and exaggerate their bravery and the tribe that they have and all of this. And if they want to condemn and attack another, even if just one person, they will denigrate him and they will remove any virtue that he has, not only him, but also his entire tribe. And that was considered to be good, good poetry. And in fact, in a sense, it's good poetry because it has so much in it. It brings so much emotions. But it's not a type of poetry that Allah Azza wa loves. So anyway, let's see what type of poetry did the Prophet ﷺ like and put in his speech. So Aisha radiyallahu anha said, هَلْ كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ يَتَمَثَّلُ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الشَّعْرِ Did the Prophet ﷺ use, recall, Poetry as proverbs, meaning recite poetry and use it for the wisdom that is in it. That is yatamathal, because mathal is a proverb. So yatamathal, he brings this poetry and uses it for its proverbs. He you do, do this. She said, Kana yatamathalu bishar ibn rawaha. He used to recite the poetry of Ibn Rawaha, Abdullah ibn Rawaha, who is a Muslim poet. So one of the poets of the Prophet وسلم, is Abdullah ibn Rawaha. So he says, كان يتمثل بشعره. He says he used to recall his poetry and recite it because of the good things that it had in it, especially wisdom. ويتمثل بقوله, يتمثل بقول من also another poet, طرفة بن العبد. Of what طرفة بن العبد said, ويأتيك بالأخبار من لم تزوده. And the and the one who you did not supply with any provisions will provide or bring the news to you. He used also to use that type of poetry and repeat it when he faces certain situations. What does that line mean? وَيَأْتِيكَ بِالْأَخْبَارِ مَنْ لَمْ تُزَوِّدِي The full verse of that um, line, of that verse, is سَتُبْدِي لَكَ الْأَيَّامُ مَا كُنْتَ جَاهِلًا the days are going to reveal to you what you did not know. وَيَأْتِيكَ بِالْأَخْبَارِ مَنْ لَمْ تُزَوِّدِي And the one you did not supply to go and seek the answer for you, bring you the news, will bring the news to you. 
So in another hadith, he said, it says that when the Prophet wasallam would experience delay in reception of news, he's waiting for something, it doesn't come very quickly. He would use that, meaning that sooner or later, from when you know, for once you know, or once you do not know, the news is going to come to you. So the news sometimes you send somebody, let's say. You're expecting, you want to know something about something. So you send someone, you say, go and find the news for me. So he goes and investigates and comes back. So this is a person that you provided, it's a person that you asked to bring the news to you. This line of the verse says, no, and sometimes someone that you did not charge with any responsibility will come and bring the news right to you, without you expecting or anticipating or asking. So that's the type of uh, that um, part of the verse, the second part of the verse that the Prophet ﷺ um, used to repeat. Meaning that, if it doesn't come, wait, and it's going to come. Right? It's for patience, meaning if it, does not, it doesn't come, wait and it's going to come. The thing that you don't know now, wait a little bit, because its time has not come, wait a little bit and its time will come and it will come to you. That information will come to you. So this is what he, وسلم, one of the uh, things that he used to repeat. If you want to know about the truest, the truest verse that a poet has said, it is the following, because the Prophet ﷺ told us, أَصْدَقُ كَلِمَةٍ قَالَهَا شَاعِرٍ The best and the truest word or sentence that a poet has said, or the most poetic in another narration, أَلَا كُلُّ شَيْءٍ مَا خَلَى اللَّهَ بَاطِلُوا Indeed, everything other than Allah is false. أَلَا كُلُّ شَيْءٍ أَلَا Indeed, كُلُّ شَيْءٍ Everything besides Allah is false. So he says that this is the best thing that the poets have said, ever. وَكَادَ أُمَيَّةُ بْنُ أَبِي الصَّلْتِ أَيْ يُسْلِمْ And Umayyah ibn Abi Salt was about to accept Islam. Umayyah ibn Abi Salt is who? Umayyah ibn Abi Salt is a poet who experienced Jahiliyyah and experienced Islam. And in Jahiliyyah, and I don't know, we probably talked about Umayyah before. Umayyat ibn Abi Salt in his Jahiliyyah, before Islam, he used to recite poetry. And they said that he read the Torah and read the Injil, read the previous books. And he knew a lot about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and about his prophets, the day of judgment and this and that. He put all of that in his poetry and in it there is a lot of wisdom about the transience of this life, about the permanence of the afterlife, about getting ready for it. There is a lot of wisdom that is really when you read it, it's, it's really Islamic. So he said that Umayyah ibn Abi Salt was about to accept Islam. But unfortunately for him, he did not. Because though, although he knew all of this, and the story goes, is that he was expecting or he was hoping that he would be a prophet. Huh? And he was reading, reading, investigating. And we know from our previous study that did the people of the book anticipate the coming of Muhammad wasallam or not? Anticipated, so they knew that he was going to come. So he had an idea that something is happening. So he was reading, reading, and sort of getting himself ready. Right? Was getting himself ready. Maybe it will be me. So when he found that it was Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he got what? Jealous. Right? He got jealous. So he rejected that, and he died in a state of disbelief. So he said he's he was about. Meaning that if you read his poetry, you'll say he's, a, he's so close to Islam. But subhanAllah, he had this jealousy in his heart. So going back to the truest sentence that a poet has said, indeed anything, ala kullu shay'in ma khalallah, anything that is other than Allah is false. The continuation of that verse, wa kullu na'imin la mahalata za'ilu. And every blessing or every comfort, indeed, is going to expire. Every blessing or every comfort, every joy indeed is going to expire. So when you actually contemplate it, this, this verse is a, one of the truest things that you will hear coming out of the mouth of poets. There's any comfort and any joy on this earth. Can it last? No. So that's what he's saying. And he was a pre-Islamic poet. But he was saying, indeed everything, every joy is going to expire. And anything that is other than Allah is false is going to expire as well. 
So if there is anything on this earth, if it, other than Allah Azza wa Jal, it will perish. كل شيء هالك إلا وجهه. Everything is gonna, you know, um, perish except Allah Azza wa Jal. So everything on this earth is gonna perish. And you also can understand it in another way. That if anything that we're doing, if it does not have Allah in it, it is batil. That is everything that you know. If you think about your job, think about, you know, um, uh, your leisure time, think about your life, your hobbies. If somehow you don't connect it to Allah Azza wa Jal, it is batil. Falsehood in the sense that it will also perish. It will not benefit you. It may harm you, but if it does not harm you, it will not benefit you. You understand? That is when you, when you die, you're not going to find this with you. So it is batil in that sense. It will expire. So subhanAllah, it, it is very insightful. أَلَا كُلُّ شَيْءٍ مَا خَلَ اللَّهَ بَاطِلُ And if the Prophet وسلم, used it, it's also, يعني, if, especially if you يعني, understand Arabic and you can uh, memorize it, it's something to keep in mind. That is the Proverbs, the ancient Proverbs of the Arabs or any other uh, proverb that is um, wise and insightful, it's good to remember it because once in a while you may need to recall it for it to um, solidify or uh, restore stability to you, harmony to you. Oh yes, these things happen, but that's the nature of this dunya. That's the nature of this dunya. Another thing that the Prophet ﷺ once said, and this is a verse uh, from a poem. And by the way, it is said that at times, Allahu A'lam, if this is all the time, but at times when the Prophet ﷺ would want to recite poetry, he would, you know, unintentionally break the rhythm. Poetry has a rhythm to it. Huh? In Arabic, it has a rhythm to it, a mirror. And so if you break it, it's no longer actually poetry. So you have to follow the mirror. So Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, وَمَا عَلَّمْنَاهُ الشِّعْرَ we didn't teach him poetry and it's not for him. So Allah Azza wa Jal said, because what did they accuse the Prophet of being? A poet. So Allah is saying, we didn't teach him poetry and it's not for him. So he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even at times when he's trying to do poetry, he'd break the mirror, he cannot. He can, even though, I mean, other people that would come naturally to them just by listening, for him it was beyond his ability to actually maintain that meter at times. So some of the uh, poetry that you will read that the Prophet used to say, it was said after it was corrected, because the Prophet said it in a, in a broken manner. So, so even poetry he could recite sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this is from Allah's protection. So that it would be clear in the people's mind that he cannot actually recite poetry. Not, not even his own. He cannot recite poetry, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anyway, one thing that the Prophet had said, once he was walking and a rock hit his foot and his toe bled. So he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, هَلْ أَنْتِ إِلَّا إِصْبَعٌ دَمِيتِي وَفِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ مَا لَقِيتِي Are you but a toe that has bled and it is in the sake of Allah, when what you're facing is only for the sake of Allah. Are you only but a toe that is bleeding and what you are facing is in the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. So this is the intent from it is what? Why did he say that Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? To belittle any suffering or any harm that he may receive for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. So the, what are you? Are you just a toe? Or a leg? Or an arm? Or a hand? Or a body? And all of this is nothing. Because you are doing this for the sake of who? Allah Azza wa Jal, you're doing this for the sake of Allah. So this is nothing. Whatever you are facing is very simple and very insignificant in light of your great goal and the reward that Allah has for you if you continue and you do it for His sake. So all of this sacrifice is easy to give because Allah Azza wa Jal is worth it. So that's why He's saying that when He's looking at His toe and He's speaking to it, because sometimes, subhanAllah, you know, you'd be doing something for the sake of Allah and you get a, I don't know, you twist your ankle, you get a back pain, uh, you injure your this or doing that. You're doing something for the sake of your family. Uh, whether it's a job outside the home or a job inside the home. 
and you're doing it for the sake of Allah and you get hurt because of it. If you remember the greater goal of why you're doing this, it is easy for you to overcome that pain and not be stuck because of it. Not dwell on it. But say, this is for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. So whatever sacrifice that needs to happen for the sake of Allah, let it happen. Because you are ultimately all for Allah. You follow me, inshallah? Yeah. Now, now the next one recounts an incident in one of the battles where the Prophet ﷺ was present. And what he said, this is the battle of Hunayn. Someone was asking a Sahabi, he says to him, asking him, Did you flee and leave the Prophet in, in that battle? Did you flee? عن رسول الله and leave him alone. He said, لا والله ما ولا رسول الله. He says, no, by, the, by Allah Azza wa Jal, the Prophet of Allah never fled, never turned away from the battle. ولكن ولا سرعان الناس But the hasty of people, these are the people who fled. So what happened? You know what happened? تلقتهم هوازن بالنبل ورسول الله على بغلته Hawazin, the tribe of Hawazin, and you know, in partnership with Thaqif, the tribe threw arrows at them, you know, rained arrows on them. So they retreated, they were frightened, and they retreated and they fled. These were the hasty people. So he was saying basically that what? During that battle, you had the Prophet wasallam and the major Sahaba around him. But you also had the hasty new Muslims, those who Iman is really not strong in their hearts, and they wanted and rushed after the spoils of war, money. They found it, and they wanted to rush and get it. When they rushed, what happened to them? What happened? Arrows, right? The arrows came after them. So it was a trick. So arrows came after them. So when they saw all of this, they ran away. And so you, you found this subhanAllah. So now the front army of the Muslims, all is retreating. And who are they leaving behind? They're leaving behind Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Prophet now is exposed. The Prophet is exposed. But interestingly, what was he riding? He's riding a mule, not riding a horse. So what do they say? Why is he riding a mule? What do you think? Why is he riding a mule? Huh? No, you can, you can put him on a horse, you can put him on a camel. Why is he riding a mule? Huh? So that it may be a disguise. Disguise? Okay, it could be like a disguise, but it's more to it than that. Is the mule fast? No, no. no, it's slow. And did he intend to run away? No. no. That is, this is confidence in the promise of Allah Azza wa Jalla. That I'm not getting a horse, I'm not getting a camel to run, you know, away with. No, I'm sitting on a mule. So on a mule, you can't run away from a mule. You can't run away from the enemy. And in fact, it says here that the Prophet ﷺ was on that mule and everybody, those people, the front of the army, Muqaddima, they were running away and he was charging. On that mule, he was charging Sallallahu and they were holding him by the rein, holding him back. Right? The Sahaba holding him back and he's charging. And what was he saying? أَنَا النَّبِيُّ لَا كَذِبُ أَنَا بْنُ عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبُ I am the Prophet, there is no lies about it, I am the son of Abdul Muttalib. Meaning in addition to it, he was what announcing to the people who was charging and he was announcing to the army, here I am, I am the Prophet, no lies or deception about it, and I am the son, his, uh, I mean he's the grandchild, but I am the son of Abdul Muttalib, who was the leader of his people, the leader of Quraysh. So that is a verse of poetry that the Prophet ﷺ said, but it is the context of this battle, where the Prophet ﷺ rushed, and him, his stability and bravery in that moment, galvanized the Sahaba around him, to come, come back, aggregate around him, and charge again, and then the Prophet and he, and them and the Prophet وسلم, succeeded because of it, and they won the battle. So subhanAllah, the battle of Hunayn tells you something that is very, very important about um, confrontation, and conflicts, and about Islam, and about Muslims, especially even today, because there's a great lesson in it today. It's not about numbers. 
there were a lot of Muslims then, and it's not about numbers. A lot of them fled. So it's not about how many people do you have in the battlefield, but it's about how many committed people do you have in the battlefield. So it's, today we're not about how many Muslims live in the world today. 1.8 billion Muslims living in the world today. It's not about that number. But among those numbers, how many Muslims are living Islam and have Islam in their hearts, those are the Muslims that are actually, actually count. We ask Allah's mercy for everybody, all those Muslims, and to guide everybody else who's not Muslim. But I'm saying, who really counts in carrying the message of Islam and changing our reality is the people who actually have Islam in their hearts. So it's not about number. Now, okay. Now another incident, and now this is happening in Umrat al-Qadha. The Umrah, when the Prophet ﷺ was going into Mecca while Mecca was under the control of Quraysh, the non-believers. So one of the things that happened there, the Prophet ﷺ entered. And Ibn Rawaha, Abdullah ibn Rawaha, is one of his poets. Remember? We just mentioned him. Abdullah ibn Rawaha is one of his poets. And he was in front of the Prophet ﷺ, and he was reciting two verses. He's saying, خَلُّوا بَنِي الْكُفَّارَ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ He says, O non-believers, clear his path. عَلَى تَنْزِيلِهِ Today we will strike you for its revelation, for the revelation of the Qur'an, by the revelation of the Qur'an, or it could mean, because of Muhammad وسلم, coming to Mecca, if you stop us, we'll strike you. So it could mean in reference to the Qur'an, or it could be, uh, be a reference to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, today we will strike you. Darban yuzilu al-hama'an maqilihi. A strike that will separate the heads from the body. Wa yudhilu al-khalila an khalilihi. And make a friend, the close friend, forget about his friend. Huh? Not a friend only. The beloved, think about the, forget about those that he loves. So that type of poetry is very boastful and combative. Right? So, Umar said, O oh, son of Rawaha, Ibn Rawaha, you're reciting poetry in front of the Prophet وسلم, and in the sanctuary of Allah, in the sacred city, you're doing this. So the Prophet وسلم, he said, Umar, let him. Umar, let him. He says, it's faster and more effective uh, in demoralizing them than arrows. Than hitting them with arrows. So if you want to understand this, think of psychological warfare. That poetry was trying to do something to demoralize the enemy. To demoralize the enemy. I will see another example of it. So though that type of poetry is very strong and is it's very combative and very boastful, you know, move and we will strike you and we will do this. But what is it? What, what is its aim? For the non-believers to hear it and be weaker because of it. To be frightened because of it or see what they are threatening us to do. Right? And see how much power they have. And see how they're willing to sacrifice their lives for the sake of this deen. So that weakens them. And by the way, this is to, for the advantage of non-believers as well. Because if they are weak, they are less likely to launch an attack against Muslims less likely to lose their lives, and more likely to accept Islam as well. Sahih? So, here subhanAllah, this is the use of psychological warfare from the Prophet wasallam to weaken the enemy. And the most effective means for it at that time was poetry. The non-believers used it, and the Muslims also used it as well. So in that, it tells you that you are allowed to use poetry first of all, if the purpose is rightful. And you're speaking the truth, and especially to champion Islam and champion Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And subhanAllah, when he said, you know, it harms them and hurts them more than arrows. Than arrows. As a poet, another poet has said, he said, if you hurt my body, it can heal. But if you hurt my heart, that never heals. Right? That never heals. So this is, this is the intent of that poetry. This Sahabi says something, and this tells you about um, something interesting about how the, prior, the companions of Muhammad وسلم, used to sit and socialize and how they used to spend their time. He said, Jalestu, 
النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أكثر من مئة مرة. I sat with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم more than a hundred times. So he's saying this to emphasize what he's going to say uh, uh, later. Bring authority to what he is saying. I sat with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم more than a hundred times. وكان أصحابه يتناشدون الشعر. His companions used to recite poetry, meaning in, in his presence, used to recite poetry. يتناشدون الشعر, meaning that someone who will say a verse. Another person will remember another verse by it. So he'll recite another verse, and so on, and so on, and so on. So this is at تناشد. وَيَتَذَاكَرُونَ أَشْيَاءَ مِنْ أَمْرِ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ وَهُوَ سَاكِتْ وَرُبَّمَا تَبَسَّمَا مَعَهُمْ And they will recall things, right, incidents from the time of Jahiliyyah, and they will recall these and talk about it, and the Prophet ﷺ is quiet, and at times he may smile. Means, first of all, that this is permissible. If the Prophet ﷺ did not object, did not correct, what does that mean? It's permissible, it's allowed. So it's allowed for a person, especially them. Yani they used to, um, in another hadith it said, that they would pray Fajr with the Prophet wasallam. that they would sit and remember Allah Azza wa Jal till sunrise, they'll pray, and then they will sit and do this in the masjid. Right? So it's beautiful, subhanAllah, you have deen and you have dunya. Huh? You, you take care of what Allah Azza wa Jal wants from you, and after that, okay, now that's time for tea and time for coffee. You want to bring donuts, whatever. You want to sit and talk. That's beautiful, alhamdulillah. So, alhamdulillah, that increase the lo- increases the love and also your commitment and their commitment to this ibadah and what follows it. So now they used to sit and they always used to say, oh, remember at the time of Jahiliyyah, we used to do this and this funny incident happened and we chased this person and he chased us. And they would smile and sometimes they would laugh. Permissible. And even in the house of Allah Azza wa Jal, Permissible as long as you're not harming other people bi'ibnillah. And also poetry. And as long as that poetry um, is, is not, does not anger Allah Azza wa Jal, then it is permissible. And sometimes he would be quiet and sometimes he would smile sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now the type of poetry that he loved was the, type, uh, uh, the poetry of Umayyah ibn Abi Salt. So someone said, I was riding behind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I recited to him one hundred lines from the poetry of Umayyah ibn Abi Salt. And each after each line, after each verse, he would say, he. He say, more. This is what it means. He meaning more. So after each verse, more. After each verse, more. Until I uh, recited one hundred lines. And then the Prophet sallallahu He is about to accept Islam. So how good his poetry was. And when you hear it, subhanAllah, you see the, how it affirms what you find in the Qur'an and what you find in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The importance of uh, poetry and then using it to defend Islam and to defend its standards and defend the Prophet ﷺ. It says here that the Prophet would put a minbar. Uh, a minbar is like a pulpit, something that you would climb on so that people will see you. He would put a pilpa, uh, pulpit for Hassan bin Thabit. Hassan ibn Thabit is the main poet of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would put the, this pulpit for him in the masjid so that he can stand on it. And يُفَاخِرُ عَنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أَوْ يُنَافِحُ عَنْ He is defending the Prophet with his poetry or boasting and praising about the Prophet. Boasting about the Prophet and praising him. In response to who? In response to whom? The attacks of the kuffar. The attacks of the kuffar, they used to claim and spread lies about him and compose poetry. So now the Muslims needed to do the same thing, compose poetry that will attack and praise. Attack the Prophet, uh, praise the Prophet wasallam, praise Islam and defend and attack the non-believers. Okay. So then he said, إِنَّ Allah Ta'ala يُؤَيِّدُ حَسَّانَ بِرُوحِ الْقُدُسِ مَا يُنَافِحُ أَوْ يُفَاخِرُ عَنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Indeed Allah, I want you to hear this. Indeed Allah is supporting Hassan with Jibreel alayhi salam as long as he is defending the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa That no one, and, and, no other than Jibreel alayhi salam who is called here Ruh al-Qudus, the pure spirit or the sanctified spirit. Okay? Maybe that's where the Christians have Holy Spirit from. Sanctified or pure spirit. That's what Jibreel is called. 
You're saying he is supporting Hassan ibn Thabit when he is standing there defending the Prophet of Allah, defending the religion of Allah and attacking the enemies of Allah. I mean, and imagine having Jibreel alayhi salam supporting him. Supporting him how? By using, subhanAllah, the best words, the best images, the most useful, you know, ways to attack the kuffar in ways that really can hurt them. And stop their attacks on the Prophet sallallahu So this tells you what for us today. That somehow, I'm not going to claim that Jibreel alayhi salam is going to be with you. And we don't have that authority, right? But... If you are in a place and in a position where you are defending Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and in defending Islam with speech or with what you write, it may be that Allah Azza wa will support you with an angel of His angels in your defense, because huh? that is what. What is that? What would you? What would we call that? When you defend the Prophet and attack his enemies, jihad. That's what it is. That's jihad. That's jihad. And that sometimes is better than the physical jihad. Meaning jihad with the body. That at times is better than the physical jihad. Hassan ibn Thabit's most valuable contribution wasn't with his physical, physical jihad, but with his verbal jihad. So some of us today, especially among the young, when hearing about jihad, jihad and defending the ummah and all of this, rather than seeking a narrow venue of jihad that is actually illegitimate, now, in reality, it's not jihad. You have other venues of jihad where actually it is legitimate. Jihad with the pen, jihad with the tongue, where you're actually defending Islam, defending the Prophet wasallam, gathering proofs for the existence of Allah. Isn't this jihad? Huh? Gathering proofs for the Prophet of Muhammad wasallam. Isn't this jihad? Um, uh, responding to criticism or doubts about Islam and Muslims or the Prophet or Allah Azza wa Jalla, isn't this jihad? All is this jihad. So if you are able to do this, subhanAllah, and you are effective in it, maybe Allah Azza wa Jalla will support you with an angel from His angels. So this is a, you know, a something, a high station that a person can aspire to be among the select few who are defending Islam and trying to spread it. And we know for sure that Allah Azza wa Jalla supported Hassan with the head angel from among all of his angels. Now, we move now to the next uh, chapter, inshallah. And the next chapter has only one week hadith in it. So I'm not going to go through the chapter because it just has only one uh, week hadith. But I just want to comment on the heading of the chapter, which is, fi kalami Rasulillah fi Samar. The reports about the Prophet وسلم, in Samar speaking after Isha, talking, sitting and talking and mingling with people after Isha. So as I said, the hadith here is weak, but in general, the Prophet وسلم, would not sleep before Isha and would hate staying up after it. Would hate staying up after Isha. That is once he praised Isha radiallahu anhu and unless he is engaged in some useful conversations with other Muslims or taking care of family affairs or whatever, what does he do? He goes to sleep, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So that because he knows that, he has something more important that will follow, which is the worship of Allah Azza wa during the night. So what I want to take from that, inshallah, especially as we go into uh, the worship and a description of the worship of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, is that staying up at night, especially way up, is one of the diseases that Muslims have today. You know, you stay up past midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, very close to Fajr. And some people sleep right before Fajr, right? Right before Fajr, or they pray Fajr and they sleep the entire day. And that is definitely not the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, maybe it's hard for us to change immediately, but at least on the horizon, we should have a goal, bi'idnillah, that I want to stop Staying up late at late, late night. You know, once you pray your Isha, take care of this, take care of that, leave all of it and go back and sleep so that inshallah you can wake up in time at least, at least for your Fajr. Let's say at least for your Fajr. That's the first goal. And for you not to waste your entire day, daytime, sleeping. Then the next goal should be at least I would have 
an hour, an hour and a half, two hours for my worship, for doing something Islamic that pleases Allah Azza wa rather than waste my time either checking my, you know, whatever, my status and his status and whatever they said to me and I said to them or playing games or talking, idle talk with someone else that benefits no one. Doesn't benefit me and doesn't benefit them. Rather focus on what benefits you. So a sama staying up is really not from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ unless you're, it's needed. You're teaching someone, you're taking care of their need, uh, you're discussing an Islamic matter, that's different. But if there is no benefit in it, then go to sleep. Right? The next chapter, which is another chapter, now that hadith is authentic, but is it such a long hadith, and it does not pertain much to what we're doing here. So I'm going to explain to you what the hadith is, take the benefit from it, but without going through the details of that hadith. And that hadith is a very famous hadith. I don't know if you've heard of Hadith Umm Zar, the hadith of the mother of Zar. Her name is Umm Zar. What is this hadith? And in fact, for, uh, if not for the Prophet's comment at the end, such a long hadith, Prophet's comment at the end, we wouldn't call it a hadith, we just call it a story or a uh, athar. Aisha radiallahu anha narrates this story. And what is this story? In pre-Islamic time, before Islam, a group of women came together, they came and sat together, and they swore that they were gonna tell the truth about their husbands. Right? They're gonna tell the truth. I mean, they are, we're gonna swear, we're not gonna hide anything. We'll tell the absolute truth about our husbands. So each one of them takes a turn and says something about her husband. So the first one criticizes, the second one criticizes, the third one praises, the fourth one praises, and so on and so on and so on. Until we reach Umm Zara at the end, and she speaks with some detail about her husband and about her life. What made this famous, one of the things that made it famous, is that subhanAllah, I mean, they're pre-Islamic, they're using very high language, very eloquent language, very creative imagery. She doesn't come and say, my husband is a bum, my husband is a loser, my, she doesn't come and say that. Or my husband is great, no. They use imagery. He's like the camel. He's like the lion. He's like a tree. He's like, and then you would have to go deep and, and try to understand what does she mean by this? Oh, he's good in this way because she likened him to that. And he's bad in that way because she likened him to that. So very creative and very eloquent. So, you know, that's why people um, study it with some detail. Then we come to Umm Muzar at the end. So Umm Muzar praises her husband. The summary of her story and you know, this hadith will be beneficial if we're talking about um, marital issues. It will be very useful. Anyway, what she says about Abu Zar is Abu Zar, she starts praising him. And that he had given her a lot of money. She loves him. He had given her a lot of money. And he honored her greatly and honored her family. And he respects her greatly. Then she starts talking about the property that she has. And how good he is. And how good her children are. Then she says that one day he saw another woman and he liked her, fell in love with her. So he divorced her and he married that other woman. And then Umm Zara goes on and she marries another man. And that other man is also good to her and he gives her and he honors her and this and that. But then he says about that second husband, he says, all the things that he had given me do not compare to the smallest bowl, plate that Abu Zara would give me. Right? It would not compare, like in comparison between the two, everything, all the good things that he has done to me does not compare to the smallest plate that Abu Zara would give to me. Meaning, you know, the gratitude that she has to the first husband and what he gave her is incomparable to the second one. So she still loves him, the first, and she still esteems him. So then the Prophet wasallam tells Aisha, Kuntu laki ka'abi zar'in li ummi zar'. I am to you like Abu Zar to Ummu Zar. I am to you like this man to his wife. Of course, minus that divorce and what happened after. And I was good to you like he was good to her. And in fact, more. But he just said like. But in fact, more. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Both in terms of religion and world. Because Abu Zar was really good to her when it came to this world. Respect, honor, she didn't need anything. He gave her a son, he gave her a daughter,
property. He made her rich and he made her family rich. Meaning that he gave her everything that she wanted. So in terms of dunya, he gave her everything. But of course, in terms of deen and religion, did he give her anything? No, nothing. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying, I am to you like Abu Zar to Ummu Zar, meaning that the honor that I gave to you. Then think about it. Aisha radiallahu anha is Aisha because she married who? The Prophet ﷺ. She had the knowledge that she has. And all the taqwa that she has. And that high station in Jannah because of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the, the favor that Muhammad has upon her cannot be compared to any other favor that any man can give to any other woman. So the Prophet is being humble by saying, I was like him. So actually, he was greater than him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In addition to the way that he treats her, he treats her very well, takes care of her feelings, whatever she needs, if it's within her means, his means, he would give to her. So it tells you about how good he was to her sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how good of a husband, how good of a father he was, and also how good of a prophet and a teacher he was sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is basically in summary the hadith of Umm Zar. And it's a long one. So inshallah azza wa you know, grants us an opportunity another time when we're talking about marriage and rights of wife, rights of husband. We'll bring this hadith and we'll talk about it in, in some detail inshallah. Now we go to a chapter about the sleep of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. A description of his sleep, the posture, what he used to say, and all of that. So the first hadith is: Al Wara ibn Azib says that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when go to bed. Now you, your intention, inshallah, should be to try to apply some of this after Isha, right? To try to apply some of this, inshallah, whatever you remember of it after Isha, inshallah. He says, "Kana ida akhda madjahu." He says, "When he would go to bed, wada akfahu liyumna tahta khadhi alayman." When he would go and lie and sleep, he would, of course, lie. It's not doesn't not mentioned here, but it's going to come. He'll be on his right side. He would take his right palm, put it under his right cheek, right, like that, and he said, "Rabbi qini qini adabka yom tabathu ibada." Ya Allah. Protect me from your punishment when you resurrect your slaves. Allahumma qini adabaka yawma tab'athu ibadak. Ya Allah, protect me from your punishment when you resurrect your slaves. Why does he mention the resurrection of the slaves? As we will see in other ad'iyya, adhkar, of sleeping and waking up. What does sleep remind you of? Death. And when you wake up, what does it remind you of? Resurrection. Right? So in fact, subhanAllah, Allah Azza wa is giving you daily or nightly, or maybe daily, nightly, depending if you sleep a day or night. Right? It gives, He's giving you an example, I'm sorry. A mini death. Mini? Mini death. Mini death. A demonstration, as he said, a mini death, a demonstration of death and resurrection. Death and resurrection. Death and resurrection. You see it in yourself and you see it in others. Huh? You, can, you can observe somebody at your home, not, don't freak them out, like we just, you know, what are you doing? I'm just, I'm watch, watching you die, right? So, it's just, you know, okay, just watch them, watch them go to sleep, and watch them, you know, come out of it. That is what resembles at times, just death, how, that, how the soul goes away, and then how it comes back. Or think about it, when you go to bed, and you drift into sleep, you don't even know where your soul is going. Where does it go? Where does it hide? Right? Where does it run away? I have no idea where it goes. And then where it comes, how does it come back? Where was it? And where does it come back? And how does it come into the body? SubhanAllah, Allah is giving you every day physical demonstration. You can see in yourself and you can see in others of life and death, life and death. So if someone says, what, is, what proof is there that there is life after death? You. You, you're a proof that there is life after death. Because you die every day and you wake up every day. Allah given you, had given you that proof. It's just because it happens every day that you don't observe it, you don't notice it. But Allah gives it to you every day. Oh, you don't want to watch humans? Look at the sun. See how Allah Azza wa Jal gives you stages, that everything goes into stages. There is um, the beginning, and its height, its strength, and then 
it goes, you know, in a down, it goes down, 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 down until it disappears and almost it dies. The sun is born, goes into the middle of the sky, that's when it's strongest and it dies. It sets and it dies. And so on, every day, every day, every day. The seasons, the same thing. So now he, as the Prophet ﷺ is reminding himself and reminding you when you say this dua, this is a reminder of resurrection. Allahumma qini adabaka yawma tabathu ibadah. Another uh, dhikr and dua. So when the Prophet ﷺ would go to bed, he would say, Allahumma bismika amutu wa ahya. Ya Allah, in your name, I die and I am revived. I die and I come back to life. So this is in reference to both sleep, right? this sleep and waking up, and the bigger sleep and the bigger resurrection. In reference to both. But sleep in itself is called death. It is death, in fact. So, bismika amutu wa ahya. So, here you are bringing in, as you say, what is the benefit of this dua? You're bringing the name of Allah Azza wa Jal and the blessing and the protection of Allah to the beginning of your sleep, its duration and its end. Bismika amutu wa ahya. As you say, when you say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, why you say Bismillah when you're reading the Quran? You're bringing this, the aid of Allah and His protection and His guidance, all of it. And there's no limit to what you're bringing. But you're bringing the name of Allah Azza wa Jal to bear on, to benefit that thing that you're doing. And so sleep is one of it. Ya Allah with your name. I sleep and I wake up. And then when he wakes up, what does he say? Alhamdulillahi ladhi ahyana ba'da ma amatana wa ilayhi nushur All praise and thanks belong to Allah who brought us to life after our death and to Him we will be resurrected. So he brought us to life. Meaning now based on this hadith, can we call sleep death or not? Yeah, because he said, he brought us to life after our death. After he had caused us to die, which is, which is sleep. And we will be resurrected to him. So subhanAllah, this also tells you something interesting about Muslims. That if your eyes are open, you will see evidence of Allah's power. And connections to what Allah Azza wa Jal has created and promised in everything that happens to you. If you can see, you will see in your uh, waking up when you wake up, in, your, in that revival, you will see the revival of the hereafter. And you will see in your sleep the death that is inevitable and we're going to touch every human being. And if you observe the rest of your life like this, you will see in it, it becomes transparent. You will see beyond it. You will not stop at it, you will see beyond it. Everything that happens is a signal of something else beyond it. So sleep is a signal of something else beyond it. And waking up is a signal of something else beyond it. And any test is a signal of something else beyond it. And you'll be able to see it if your eyes are sensitive enough and your heart is a living heart that is sensitive to what is happening to it. So Alhamdulillah, all praise be to Allah that He had brought us back to life after He had caused us to die, meaning in our sleep and the resur resurrection will be to him. And why is he praising Allah? Alhamdulillah. Let me ask you. Why is he saying Alhamdulillah? Hmm? I'm sorry, but louder. Coming to life again. So he's praising Allah for coming to life again. Why is he praising Allah for coming back to life? More chance to remember Allah Azza wa Jal. More chance to remember Allah. Because when you were asleep, you don't have that opportunity, right? You can't, you can't praise Allah, you cannot worship, although you can transform your sleep into worship with a proper intention. But you can't remember Allah, you cannot pray, you cannot. So when Allah gives you life again and you wake up and you say, I'm still in this dunya, means that you have another chance to erase your sins, another chance to climb another level of Jannah, another chance to please Allah, another chance to learn another ayah or another hadith. Right? Read another page of the Qur'an. <coughs> Go to someone else that you have harmed and say, forgive me. All this is another chance from Allah Azza wa Jal, another day for you. That is another gift for you. Just like if you think if somebody every day comes and gives you food or gives you a gift and you say, here. And you say, thank you for it. So every day is a gift from Allah Azza wa Jal. And when you think about it like that, you'll start treating it as a gift and take advantage of it. Sahih? Is it our problem is that we don't think of it as a gift. Sometimes we say, oh, I don't want to wake up. Why am I up? Right? I don't want to, I want to go back to sleep. I hate today. 
Okay, yeah, but inshallah, if you, if you change your attitude and say, no, this is a gift from Allah, actually, He gave me this. He gave me this. He could have not, but He gave me this. And if you think of it as a gift, wake up and face this gift with energy. Alhamdulillah, Ya Allah, you gave it, let me do something good in it. And even if you find hardship, Alhamdulillah, that hardship is there by design to remove away your sins and bring you closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. So also embrace that and keep going because it's a gift. And finish that day and say, Alhamdulillah, that I finished the day, another day that will be a witness for me, not against me. For me, not against me, Alhamdulillah. This is something I think that everybody d does, and if you don't do it, you should start doing it. Right? Inshallah. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi when he goes to bed, Jama'a kafayhi, he would hold his hands together. Okay. فَنَفَثَ فِيهِمَا And he would blow into them. وَقَرَأَ And he will read in them. What will he read? The last three surahs from the Qur'an. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ ثُمَّ مَسَحَ بِهِ مَا مَسْتَطَاعَ مِنْ جَسَدِهِ Then he will wipe over whatever he can from his body. يَبْدَأُ بِهِ مَا رَأْسَهُ وَوَجْهَهِ He will start with his head and face. وَمَا أَقْبَلَ مِنْ جَسَدِهِ And the front part of his body. And then whatever he can reach from his body. يَفْصَعُ ذَلِكَ ثَلَاثَ مَرَّاتِ He will do this three times. He will do this three times, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what, is, what did he used to do? So you bring your hands together. And you blow in it three times, no spit, three times. And then you will read, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقْ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ And then you will take your hands and you will wipe over your entire body. You will do this once, then a th second time, and then a third time. And what does that do? That's protection. That's healing, that's shifa. Right? So if you read all of these, you're seeking protection from Allah Azza wa Jal. And it's said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to read a lot of ruqya on himself and others. Until Allah revealed this, so he adhered to these and left other ruqyas. So this is a full, complete ruqya for yourself. Before you get sick, huh? before you get envy, huh? You have this daily, nightly protection from the Prophet ﷺ. So if you need healing, maybe you're sick now, subhanAllah, something is, is, pains you, and you need healing, do this. If you want to have a better sleep, bi'idhnillah, especially if you're experiencing nightmares, bad dreams, uh, restless sleep, you have to go back to those adhkar and ad'iyah of sleep and say all of them. And then bi'idhnillah, you'll have a better sleep. And then the scholars say something that is good to keep in mind. He says, something, someone who recites this, he reads these surahs and the other adhkar, knowing what they mean, intending their meaning, will have the full protection from Allah Azza wa Jal. I mean, you are reading it with intention. If you're reading it without intention, you'll have some protection, but not as strong as the first. Because here you're aware of what you're saying. Just like dua. When you're making dua to Allah Azza wa Jal, and this is basically asking Allah. So when you're making dua, the more that you are present, the more that Allah will accept your dua. Right? So, and this is the same thing. It's the same thing. If you say it, aware of what you're saying and you intend it, and for that you probably will have to go to a book of tafsir. Even if it's a short commentary. Or at least, let's say, another translation. And then remember the meaning. So that when you're saying it, you know that you're asking Allah for something. And what is this something I'm asking Allah for? So you're aware of it. So when you're saying it, you'll find out, insha'Allah, that Allah Azza wa Jal will give you even better and better protection. Naam, Zakallah, that's a good question. So he's saying when we blow, do we blow before or we blow after? That is, we read and we blow or we blow and then read. So the ulama disagree on that based on the hadith. The ulama disagree. So some say exactly like this hadith. You blow and read and wipe. And some of the ulama say, you know, no, the meaning of it is that, no, you actually read and blow. So Allah A'lam, because of that disagreement, if you do the first or the second, you're fine, inshallah. And also they say combine the three of one time all No, don't combine the three. So this question about combining all the qul, three, 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 like all together and doing it all now. 
The sunnah is قُلُوا اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ قُلُوا أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلُوا أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ You wipe. قُلُوا اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ قُلُوا أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلُوا أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ You wipe. Then one one and then you wipe. Oh no, it has to be like that. قُلُوا اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ قُلُوا أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلُوا أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ And then you will wipe it all or your entire body, whatever you can reach. Don't worry about the parts that you cannot reach. And so then you do this a second time, and then you do the, this a third time, inshallah. And the blowing, if you want to follow this hadith, it will say you blow first, and then you wipe. But some other ulama have said otherwise, that you know you blow after. Can you read Al-Fatiha and Ayat Al-Kursi? Ayat Al-Kursi is from the Adhkar. Ayat Al-Kursi is from the Adhkar that you, when you go to bed. And no, it's not necessary that you read it after. You can read the Ayatul Kursi before, you can read it after. It is up to you. It is up to you. No, 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 no. It's not 333 and you have to read the Fatiha after. No, no, no. No, no, no. You want to read the Fatiha, you can. The Fatiha is not specified as something that you read when you go to bed. Ayatul Kursi is. But the Fatiha is up to you. You want to read it, you can read it, inshallah. It's just Quran. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. I don't recall that it's mentioned as part of the thing that you go to read before you go to bed. We'll see some of them, inshallah. And I want to stop, inshallah, at time. Do we have a box? You can get us a box, inshallah. Yeah, exactly. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Now, so, um, now, the following, inshallah, let me at least let's finish this chapter and then we can, inshallah, open it up for a few questions. كان رسول الله إذا أوى إلى فراشه قال when he would go to bed he would say الحمد لله الذي أطعمنا وسقانا وكفانا وآوانا فكم من لا كافي له ولا مؤوي let me explain then I'll repeat it I'll say الحمد لله so الحمد لله all praise and thanks to Allah عز وجل who fed us and gave us drink وكفانا وآوانا and sufficed us meaning sufficed us of all of our needs or troubles, sufficed us, and gave us shelter. For how many? There is no one, for, or for how many? There is no one who suffices them or grants them shelter. You know, how many are there who don't have someone to suffice them, take care of their needs, or grant them and give them shelter? So here the Prophet ﷺ is recognizing Allah's ni'mah before he goes to sleep. And what is the ni'mah that the Prophet ﷺ is recounting? And what is this ni'mah? Because the ni'mah, sleep itself is a ni'mah, but what is, he, what is it reminding him of? First, at'amana wa saqana. He gave us food and drink. Because huh? sometimes, subhanAllah, it's very hard to go to sleep if you're hungry and thirsty. Huh? So part of the ni'mah of Allah Azza wa Jal is that He has taken care of the needs of your body. And they sleep, huh? and food and drink. So now I'm about to sleep, and that is a need that my body has. It can't survive without it. And also it reminds me of the other need that he took care of. That he gave me something to eat, and he also gave me something to drink. So I'm not in need. I'm not suffering. وَكَفَانَا وَآوَانَا And he sufficed us. Meaning whatever I wanted, Allah Azza wa has sufficed me. He was sufficient for me. وَآوَانَا And he gave us shelter. For there are so many, he's saying, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, are without one to suffice them, or is sufficient for them, or without one to give them shelter. So again, he's he's praising Allah azza wa jal for the fact that he is there in his home, even if your home is very small and very modest, but it's a shelter. He's saying, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, there are many today who are without shelter, many who are without shelter. And by the way, you know. Allah Azza wa Jal had given all humanity, even animals, shelter. And Allah Azza wa Jal has sufficed all of humanity, including animals. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's talking about the complete shelter and the complete sufficiency. That Allah Azza wa Jal has taken care of all of my needs, especially my religious and spiritual needs, more than the physical ones. If I'm looking for the truth, Allah had guided me to it. If I want protection, Allah has protected me. 
protection from humans and protection from the jinn and the shayateen, Allah had protected me. If I needed something from him, really needed something from him, not a transient thing, but really needed something from him, he gave me. And the sufficiency of Allah will be up to the degree where you think Allah will be. The more that you depend on Allah, the more that Allah will be sufficient for you. Do we know that? Do we know that? وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ The one who relies upon Allah, Azzawajal, Allah will be sufficient for him. So in, in proportion to your tawakkul, Allah will be sufficient for you. So if Allah, if you think Allah has not been sufficient for you, what is the problem? Where is the problem? Is in the tawakkul. I didn't really trust Him enough or rely upon Him enough. Otherwise, Allah would completely take care of your needs. It's not, it doesn't mean that He's going to make you a millionaire. Huh? It doesn't mean that He's going to give you servants and you know, mansions. That's not what it means. But it means that if you truly trust Allah and give Him all of your needs and trust that He will take care of them, Allah will take care of them. So, فَكَمْ مِمَّنْ لَا كَافِيَ لَهُ How many are there on this earth who have no kafi? They have no kafi because they did not choose Allah as a kafi. Huh? They did not choose Allah as a kafi. They trusted themselves and other humans. So they have no kafi. No one to suffice them. No one to take care of them. وَلَا مُؤْوِي And no one to give them shelter because they did not seek shelter with Allah. Who did they seek shelter with? Other inferior beings. But not Allah Azza wa Jal. So the greatest ni'mah is not only, of course, the house is a ni'mah. Being in a heated room is a ni'mah, right? Cold outside. Being in a heated room is a ni'mah. Being safe is a ni'mah. But more than that, the greater sufficiency is the sufficiency of the heart. And the greatest shelter is the shelter that Allah gives to the heart. Because if the, if the heart is not secure and at peace, you could be living in a mansion, but the mansion could be like a prison. And if the heart is at peace, you could be living in the humblest of dwellings, of homes. But you'd, be, well, you'd feel like you're in a mansion, you're like a king, subhanAllah. Now, the last hadith in this chapter, and we'll probably stop there, inshaAllah. Um, and the Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kana idha arrasa bilaylin iddaja'a ala shiqqihi al-ayman. Wa idha arrasa qubayla subhi nasabi dhira'ahu wa wada'a ra'asahu ala kaffi. He says if the Prophet ﷺ, meaning if he's traveling, gets off his camel to sleep or rest, and it's still night, meaning there's still some time till Fajr prayer, he would lie on his right side. His habit ﷺ, was to lie on his right side. So this is describing a particular thing that he used to do when traveling. And you can take something from it, inshallah. وَإِذَا عَرَّسَ قُبَيْلَ الصُّبْحِ نَصَبِ ذِرَاعًا And if he uh, dismounts and rests before Fajr, meaning there's still a short time before Fajr, it's not Fajr yet and he's traveling, not Fajr yet, but Fajr is about to come, but he wants to rest, نَصَبَ ذِرَاعَهُ He would rest on his, um, what is it it's called? Palm. Uh, palm. He would rest on his palm and the hand would be resting on the elbow, okay, raised. And he would be on his right. Okay? Meaning, he will not rest his head on the floor. His head would be raised by the palm that is raised by the elbow. And why is he doing this? If he's doing like that. I don't know if you can see me. Right? This is what he's doing. Lying on, on the floor. On the ground. Why is he doing, why is he resting like this? Okay? To get a nap. To so make sure that he would not miss... Fajr, because you can't sleep like that. You can rest, but you cannot sleep. You cannot fall asleep when you're like that. So that he, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, would not fall asleep and miss Fajr. He would not let his let his head rest on the ground because he could sleep. So he would only rest on his palm like that, so to make sure that the body is resting. But I'm waiting for Fajr. Okay? So this is the care that the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, would take even when he's traveling. Okay? He's not, you know, in his home. Even when he's traveling, he would take the utmost care so that he would not miss uh, the appointed time of Fajr. The next chapter is a, one of the longer chapters, and it's a very useful chapter about the worship of the Prophet ﷺ, description and what he used to do. So we will stop here, inshallah, so that we will um, uh, reveal to you the answers to the questions last week. Was it last week? It was last week, inshallah. And 
that winners, insha'Allah. So, let's see, insha'Allah, what we have here. We'll first answer the questions and then see who got them right, insha'Allah. So the first question, this is for 17 and below, right? And by the way, alhamdulillah, we had a lot of entries from 17 and below. Alhamdulillah, both male and female. So this is something yeah, to thank Allah for. Alhamdulillah. The Prophet, we said, loved meat. What part of the lamb did he love the most? What was it? The shoulder. The shoulder. Is that an easy one, right? Alhamdulillah. So that was the shoulder. So if you wrote the shoulder, you got the right answer. Alhamdulillah. So the second for 18 and above. And not many people got this. Very, very, very few people got this. I think among the brothers, I don't know if anybody got it. Okay, among the sisters, maybe a couple, but among the brothers, maybe because it's about Aisha radiallahu anha, so that sisters remembered, I don't know. So the virtue of Aisha is like the virtue of one food over all other food. What food is that, and why is it special? So who remembers? What food is it? It's a kind of soup. Huh? Instead of harid. Tharid. It's called tharid. In some countries, till today, they still cook tharid, and they call it tharid. I just found that out. So tharid. So what is tharid? So if you did not know the, that word itself, tharid, the name of that food, you could describe it. So what is tharid? It is... There is... Okay, so there is broth or stock in it. Meat and bread. This is it. This is what tharid is. So... You, got, you have your bread, you, you, you uh, pour over it the stock or the broth of the meat, and then you put meat on top. That's what basically tharid is. And why is it special? You remember why is it special? It's a complete meal. It's a full complete meal. You have your bread, you have your uh, stock in it, and you have your uh, meat. So this is uh, a complete meal. Um, what, do you, what do you do or say if you forget to say Bismillah at the beginning of a meal? Ah, very good. Bismillahi fi awalihi wa akhiri. Or Bismillahi awalahu wa akhira. So, this is what you say. Bismillah in the beginning and at the end. Alhamdulillah. So, this, and it wasn't difficult. I hope, inshallah. That was not difficult. It was not meant to be difficult. So, let's see, inshallah. So, for, this is girls below. Women. Boys. Now. So, for the sisters... I think I have one complete answer. And I'm sorry, I did not pass the gifts to the sisters, so I'll do this, inshallah, after the lesson immediately. Um, so the one complete answer is from Sister Naima Hassan. And she had the full answer about the food and why is it a full meal. So she wins, inshallah. I hope that she's there to claim her prize. Inshallah, after the halaqa, I'll pass that on to the sisters. So that's done with, inshallah. So that takes care of the sisters. The brothers, you didn't do very well with that question. So I apologize. Uh, better luck next time, inshallah. There's no luck in it, actually. And, but inshallah, try harder next time. Uh, let's do the um, boys, uh, 17 and below, inshallah. So, yeah, you're my helper, actually. I gotta mix them and pick one, inshallah. I hope you're here. Okay. Inshallah. Naam, so I have Mas'ud. Mas'ud, are you here? Mas'ud, come. Come. Mubarak. Congratulations, Mas'ud. You got the right answer. Come. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah khair. Mubarak, here. Spend it all in one place. Go. $20. Go ahead. Jazakallah khair. Yeah, yeah, masjid is generous, yani. Yeah. <laughs> Just keep coming and keep answering, inshallah. Okay, Zakallah. Unfortunately, I mean, I, I don't have access to the sisters, but I hope, inshallah. Um, if not, if the, that sister that we're going to pick is not there, I'll just do this again, inshallah, with the sisters over there. So pick one for us, inshallah. Does this say shukri? Okay. So I have here shukri. I hope you're there shukri. 
So I'll inshallah make my way, inshallah, I hope before the salah over there and make sure that you're there and if not, we'll, we'll pick another winner. But I hope that uh, Sister Shukri is there. Okay, inshallah. Uh, I hope so, yeah. Maybe you should put your last name. If there are multiple Shukris, that'd be a tough one. Inshallah. Any questions, inshallah, before we... Uh, next uh, week, we'll be meeting after Isha. Yeah. Right? Yeah, just keep them there in case, you know, something happens. Exactly. So next week, inshallah, Isha probably will be at 7, right? So we'll be meeting, inshallah. The halaqa will start right after Isha, inshallah. I hope that this is really very convenient yeah. for everybody, inshallah. Questions, inshallah, before we leave? Or did you guys ask everything already? Naam, naam. So this did not encompass, this did not uh, encompass all the athkar and ad'iyah before you go to bed. It just mentioned some. So one of it, is, of course, is you to say, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, 33 times. Alhamdulillah, 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 33 times. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, 33 times. And at the end, La ilaha illallah wahdahu, or is it 30, no, takbir 34 times. So this يعني, gives you subhanallah as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to his daughter Fatima radiyallahu anha when she came asking for assistance, she needed a servant because there's just too much work for her. And he said, shall I not tell you and direct you to what is better to you than a servant? Say this before you go to bed. So you're here bringing the name of Allah azza wa into your body, into your home. Allah azza wa will grant you as a result and because of what the Prophet said, energy for the next day. So if you feel that you're tired, you're overwhelmed by things to do inside the home, outside the home, again, instead, instead of taking energy drinks or uh, this or that, try this. And with some continuity. Every day, every day, and you'll find that bi-idhnillah, bi-idhnillah, the name of Allah Azza wa will energize you. So subhanallah, 33 times, alhamdulillah, 33 times, and Allahu Akbar, 34 times, inshallah. Now, inshallah. Now, You, you do, you will die, yes, it's death. Your soul leaves the body. How does soul leave the body? Is it part, any part of the body is coming out? It's, uh, yeah, so he's asking, Zakallah Khair, uh, how does the soul leave the body? This is part of the ghayb that Allah Azza wa Jal or His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi did not teach us. Of course, it doesn't leave it exactly like death, like the major death. It doesn't leave it like that because that's a complete separation. A way, a departure that where it doesn't come back and it has no connection to the body at all. So this departure, inshallah, is still connected to the body, but it's still disconnected from it. So in a way that we don't really understand. Yeah. So it's like, as I mentioned, the ashram, the ruh, the ruh is the body of the only. Ah, ah. ruh, min amir rabbi. وَمَا أُتِيتُ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا So they ask you about a ruh, there's a ruh of the affairs, that pertain to Allah Azza wa Jal. So he did not share that with us. So exactly how did, does it leave and... We're not, we're not told, we're not told. Where does it go? How, how does it connect? Where does it stay? We don't know. And that, you know, is something that SubhanAllah, you ask, what's the wisdom in it? One of the wisdom in it is that, as the scholars of Islam said, if you cannot understand your own soul, meaning how you basically operate, how do you seek to understand fully Allah Azza wa or His entire wisdom? If the soul that is between your own shoulders, you fail to comprehend, then your comprehension is lacking as a human being. So that's evidence in it that no matter how much you know, there's always a gap. And that gap is only filled by whom? Allah Azza wa Either directly by teaching you or by referring this issue to Him. It can never be filled by anybody else. Ah. Yes. Yeah, No. Nah. No. Nah. So how we can actually, you know, I mean, at times there's different two of you side here in the Namaz, but you don't know the meaning. So is it really necessary for us to know the meaning and then decide the two of? No. Nah. So the brother is asking, you know, if your mother tongue is not Arabic and you're reciting adhkar, ad'iya, and surahs in the salah and outside, and you don't know the meaning of it. Is it necessary that you get to know the meaning first and then recite? No, it's not necessary. 
um, especially when it comes to salah, especially like, let's say somebody just embraces Islam or starts praying after they haven't, and they're learning these surahs. We're not going to tell them, learn the meaning first and then say these surahs. No, learn it by heart first, even if you don't understand it, so that your salah is valid. But then the next stage, inshallah, is for you to learn the meaning. And then, because when you learn the meaning, your heart is be able to respond to what you're saying. If not, there will be this great disconnection between your tongue as it's moving and your heart as it's drifting and thinking about everything else except what you're saying because you don't understand what you're saying. And you can see it, subhanAllah, in people who are learning, learning Arabic. They'll tell you that now I can feel the Quran better. Now I connect with it better. So, of course, Allah Azza wa understands our limitations as humans and Allah will give us in according to our own striving. So as long as someone is striving, is trying, Allah gives you your full reward I'm trying my best to understand. It's as if you know, inshallah, you got it. So the next step is that you should try. The next step, inshallah, you know, you have um, translations of the Quran, word for word translation, basic books of Arabic, that you will be able, inshallah, to understand what that word means. Qamar means moon, shams means sun. So whenever you encounter it in the Quran, uh, you can connect to what Allah is saying. Especially so in the smaller surahs, it, you know, it, it, um, it pays off to spend some time studying them and understanding the Arabic, you'll begin to react to it better. Inshallah. Yeah. So from the hadith that you have recited with the study, yeah. it is evident that uh, poetry, no. as long as you're not engaging in something that displeases Allah, is allowed. No. But what are those people who say it is Amr al-Shaytan, what is there? What is the basis for that? Are there other hadiths that say you leave away poetry? Naam. So the brother Zahla Khair is asking about poetry and that we understand that the beneficial uh, part of poetry is beneficial and desirable. But then where does it come from that people say it's from the work of the shaitan? Um, we have, first of all, that Allah Azza wa Jal criticizes poets in the Quran. That's the shu'ara are being followed by the misguided. And Allah Azza wa there is talking about a specific type of poetry. Why? Because we know that the Prophet had poets. So that criticism doesn't apply to Hassan. Doesn't apply to Abdullah ibn Rawaha. So what is the difference between the poets that Allah criticizes? And there is a hadith I'm trying to recall that something like if, uh, if one of you were to be filled with pus, it's better with him than to him memorize poetry. What is this in reference to? Is that a bad type of poetry? is that harmful type of poetry that displeases Allah, which was at one point common. At one point, it was the common type of poetry. But if a person memorizes uh, the poetry of Abdullah ibn Rawaha, or Abdul, um, uh, even Umayyah, who is not Muslim, or Hassan ibn Thabit, then there's nothing wrong with it. If they compose poetry for good reasons, even artistic reasons that don't displease Allah Azza wa Jal, but you know, praises nature or you know point people's attention to it or there's wisdom in it that also is beautiful and Allah Azza wa in fact could reward people for it and we may know this or not but within Islamic branches of knowledge one of the ways of how people sought to teach Islamic disciplines of let's say fiqh or sul al-fiqh hadith Quran is by composing poetry that actually um, teaches the basics of this branch of knowledge. So some people, when they wanted to memorize, let's say, um, you know what, even like a shama'il or the seer of the Prophet wasallam, there's an alfiya, a poem made of a thousand verse, chronicling the life of Muhammad wasallam. That's poetry. And that's a good type of poetry. There's another one in grammar. There's another one in hadith. There's another one in usul al-fiqh. So here the scholars of Islam themselves used poetry. A Shafi'i himself was known to be a poet, a good poet. Right? So the problem with poetry is what? The problem with poetry is that if you want to only be honest, right, you'll have good poetry. But if you want to really, really be good, the shaitan may try to convince you to lie a little bit. And that's, that's the trickery of the shaitan, trying to use poetry to slide you into what displeases Allah. Yeah, yeah you boast about your knowledge and about this and about that and it's fake so when it's fake allah hates it but when it's true allah loves it because if it has good meaning 
It's good, inshallah. So they say poetry is like ordinary speech. Hasan hu hasan wa sayyi hu sayyi. It's the good part of it is good, and the bad part of it is bad, inshallah. So if you're writing poetry in Arabic or you're writing it in English, nothing wrong with it as long as the content is good, is pleasing to Allah. Okay. What does this mean about the Umayya ibn Abi Salt. Umayya ibn Abi Salt. And he may have a diwan, you know, collected poems. Uh, that uh, you read it, and when you read it, he'll talk about the angels, the day of judgment, and Allah being above his throne and stuff. SubhanAllah, you know. So, release you, every, everybody. Done? Well, inshallah. So next week, inshallah, we'll see you after Isha bi Ibnillah, and the chapter will be about the worship of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. SubhanakAllah wa bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaykul hamdulillahi rabbil alamin.